So we have no information about the levels of spike produced, the distribution of spike produced, and the duration of spike produced. You don't know even the targets. uh, Well, just so. We don't know the cells that they're infecting or transfecting. So, well, technically transducing or transfecting. So what we do know is that the adenoviral vectors were designed for prolonged high-level protein expression. That's what they were selected for. The mRNA logic is that it enables a shorter-term drug-like activity, and then the RNA is degraded. But we don't know what those kinetics are. So the, the regulators have, in, to my, in many ways, to my eyes, in looking at, for instance, the Japanese common technical document, there's, there's data in there that, to my eyes, as a, as a specialist in this, have been designed to give the right answer, the answer that's desired by the pharmaceutical company, not the uh, scientifically rigorous answer. And uh, and I believe that the re- the only explanation I can come up with is that the regulators didn't have it. In it's hard to understand this because it was global. That the regulators didn't have the sufficient background to comprehend the data that they were shown and its deficiencies. Now, uh, I should let uh, um, the team translate. I apologize for running over, uh, but I I wanted to make this key point that we, we do not understand how much protein is being made by any of these genetic vaccine technologies, where it's being made, and for how long is it being made. And I believe that is a major uh, over, yes. oversight. And, and we Thank also you. know in the meantime that contrary to what the makers of these vaccines uh, told us, it doesn't stay at the injection site, but rather it moves no. pretty much everywhere in, in your body, right? Um, to some extent. And this gets to my point. So what Pfizer, I've only seen the Pfizer CTD that was released from Japan. Okay, so I can't say what Moderna has done or what J&J or Oxford uh, slash AZ has done. I haven't seen those dossiers. In the case of Pfizer, they, they characterize the, uh, the pharmacodistribution, is the technical term, of the uh, uh, active drug material and the expression of the uh, transgene, the uh, encoded uh, RNA, not using the final drug product, but rather using a surrogate. So this is uh, red flag number one. That's not usually allowed. So they didn't characterize the expression of spike in the animal models. They characterized the expression of luciferase. Luciferase is the protein that makes the firefly tail glow. I think you see these in the forests here. In Yes, okay, good. Uh, so it's very sensitive reporter gene because it produces photons, and we have photon cameras. Normally, the way that that is characterized is you dissect the animal, and you lyse the cells in each sample, and then you can calculate precisely how much protein But remember, we're not even talking about the spike protein. We're talking about the firefly protein. There's a parlor trick that can be done with luciferase, wherein you image the whole animal. So you put the photon camera over the whole animal. I've done this. It's really neat. You inject the luciferin. The animal is either sacrificed or anesthetized. And you can see the photons come all the way through the animal and pick it up on your camera, and you get a glow patch at the site of the expression. However, you can appreciate these photons are having to pass through the tissue, muscle, bone, skin, a hair, everything else. They get scattered all over the place. And so this very neat trick 
which is, you know, great for covers of journals, uh, is really biased to only picking up the signal where there is the most expression. It's the least sensitive method, yet that's the method that Pfizer used for their dossier. So based on that, Pfizer asserts that the expression is localized just to the site of injection. But in fact, what they did is they ran a highly biased assay. And this, this illustrates my point. I think that the regulatory authorities weren't not sufficiently technically expert to comprehend that we have an expression in the state pulling the wool over your eyes to, to, to comprehend that Pfizer had selected the least sensitive method to characterize the distribution of expression of a surrogate protein rather than the actual uh, uh, drug product. Would it be possible to mark with a C14 or some radioactive uh, uh, substance to mark uh, the vaccine and to con control the distribution by that means? They did look at the distribution of RNA using tritium. And in fact, that does show uh, while the majority stays in the local region in the small number of non-good laboratory practice study uh, rodents, um, a substantial fraction does distribute it throughout the animal. What, what is many people alarmed is that if you imagine, so I have to get into the technical a little bit, um, but I'm going to make it easy. If you imagine that these particles are like an envelope and RNA is the letter inside, the envelope are fats. And these are chemically synthesized fats. They characterize, in the Pfizer dossier, they characterize the distribution of these fats. And what was, what has many people concerned, I'm choosing my words, is that about 12% of those lipids concentrate in the ovaries of the female animals but not in the testis of the male animals. This is often misinterpreted as a, a marker of where the protein is expressed. And, and people have asserted that this means that we have spike protein being expressed in the ovaries. That's not true. But we can say based on those non-GLP rodent studies, limited number of rodents, that there's a sign that the lipids are preferentially concentrated in ovarian tissue. And of course that has implications. This feeds back onto the point in this checklist that's used for vaccines by most regulators. With traditional vaccines, genotoxicity and reproductive toxicity are often not required. With the gene therapy product, they absolutely are required. Um, in this case, by Pfizer's own admission in their protocol, but it's also in the CTD, the reproductive toxicology studies were not done rigorously, and there were no genotoxicity studies done. So we have, to be technically accurate, we have evidence in non-good laboratory practice studies of concentration of the synthetic lipid into ovarian tissue and spleen and bone marrow and liver and other places you might expect it to distribute to, but the ovarian tissue is particularly concerning. Uh, uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm being told that I'm, I'm running out of time here, so uh, by my wife, uh, <laughs> forgive me. So, but have, have I answered your question? Wolfgang. Yes, it, I think it was a very, very important message you just gave. And... Uh, I think it's a fundamental critics of what we are experiencing with how the use of, of billions of people are vaccinated with, with the stuff, which is not thoroughly examined before. And I've never experienced such thing in my life as a doctor. And all standards we know and we have practiced for, cent for, for tens of years, they are opposite to that. And it is not to be understood with medical ethics what is ha just happening now. Precisely. That's my, that is my core argument, is that uh, with all of this uh, pressure 
uh, from uh, governments in the press and the media and the censorship, uh, we are failing to meet the fundamentals of medical ethics at, that go back to the Nuremberg trials. That's and those right. are there must be complete disclosure of risk. Those risks must be comprehended, and there has to be free willingness to accept the product. It cannot be coerced or enticed. Those are bedrock principles, and these are currently experimental products. Uh, and for some reason, governments around the world have decided that they can jettison these fundamental ethics uh, and uh, hastily implement these vaccines and do it in a universal way. And this is another core problem, is that the normal practice is that we do risk-benefit analysis stratified by special populations, adults, elderly, children, adolescents, pregnant women, yes. etc. But there's been this push that we take if you if you follow the logic, we're applying the aggregated risk that is almost completely concentrated in the elderly and the obese and some special populations. We're applying that risk to the entire population and using that to justify vaccinating the entire population with Even the logic children. that this will enable that this will enable herd immunity. But it won't enable herd immunity because the vaccines are not sterilizing for the virus. And sure. the whole logic, when you examine the underlying logic of what is being promoted, it falls apart. And this is what gives rise to the conspiracy theories, because clearly the, the, this logic that we've applied for vaccine development over decades, as you correctly say, you know. is not being followed.